Um, welcome to the Flux booth, our online booth here at KubeCon EU 2022. We're really excited to have uh, guest speakers, uh, one of which right now is Rosemary Rang from HashiCorp, who's on the developer relations team, and will tell us about uh, secrets and GitOps, which I know is very, very important for uh, many of you enterprise users of both um, Flux and Vault. Uh, Rosemary, take it away. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me here at the virtual booth. Today, we're going to talk about something near and dear to me, which is securing secrets and how you're going to do that in a GitOps framework like Flux. Uh, I think it's really interesting that we've, and, and actually in former development life, I have done this. Um, part of how we manage secrets as developers involved, like getting an encryption key, encrypting that secret and committing that secret to version control, right? So it's nothing inherently bad necessarily. It's not the best situation, but it does work. Um, at the end of the day, if someone is looking at your repository, they're not going to see that secret in plain text, hopefully. Um, and this is something that you know we commonly use Mozilla Sops as a tool to help us do. So uh, in the case of HashiCorp Vault, if you're not familiar with Vault, that's all right. Uh, we'll go over it in more detail later uh, and you can always reach out to me and ask questions. But assuming you do something like a secrets manager like Vault, Vault offers an encryption key that you can use to encrypt the secret. And then you can commit that encrypted secret to version control. It's not ideal though. What happens when you accidentally commit a plain text secret? This has happened to me a few times. Uh, in this sort of scenario, you often have to go back, identify which secret you accidentally committed in plain text. Then you have to go and identify which repositories were affected by said plain text secret, rotate the secret and go through this process, a process that I like to nickname Plan R, AKA Plan Remediation. Um, you often start with regret that you committed the plain text secret in the first place, you revoke the secret, you rotate it with a new one, you reference, and then you replace it. Uh, you know, the control find and control replace functionality is your best friend in this scenario. And then you rerun everything. So that means your pipelines, that means your GitOps, you know, in, in the case of GitOps frameworks like Flux, you'll have to reconcile everything, right? So the idea is that this is a really painstaking operational process that you have to take if you accidentally compromise the secret. Or more importantly, if you maybe needed to rotate the secret because it's expired or something. So you may want to optimize plan R a little further by doing something with a secrets manager. So a secrets manager securely stores the secret. Some rotate the secrets for you, like Hashikra Vault. And what they also do is audit access. So it audits who's accessing what secret, what identity is uh, going to retrieve it, when they retrieved it, and how, uh, how long they used it for. So that's part of the uh, expiration handling in a secrets manager. The tricky part, though, is that if you're doing this in Kubernetes, um, you know, Kubernetes in, in some ways doesn't really have official secrets management. It has a secrets object, right? And the secrets object is stored in plain text. And often you need to add role-based access controls in order to ensure that the right person is accessing the right secret or the right identity from a service is accessing the right secret and not more. And so what you can do is opt to use the secrets manager to secure your secrets a little bit better. The downside is that it's no longer a Kubernetes secret object. And there's this tension between the two, right? Because a lot of tools, a lot of applications use Kubernetes secrets objects in their deployments. A secrets manager, on the other hand, is a third party external uh, tool that you'll have to reference. So how do you reconcile the two? Uh, and how do you make sure that you're doing this the right way, injecting your secret correctly, uh, and maybe you're able to, let's say, limit the refactor you need to make on your applications? All right, so one way you can do this is the most, I would say, more secure way um, is to use a secrets manager plus Kubernetes by omitting the Kubernetes secret entirely. This workflow is a little bit tough to read. Um, you can learn more about that in some resources I'll attach later. But the idea is to use file-based secrets injection with the secret store CSI driver. The secret store CSI driver is a newer project, but uh, it's a great way to inject secrets securely into your applications using a volume mount. 
instead of using a Kubernetes secret. So what this is, is localizing the access to that secret to the pod uh, or the application that needs it, right? You're not just directly saying, you know, any, you know, are you role-based access control? Anybody in this namespace could access it. It has to be the pod identity itself, accessing that secret from the volume mount. The problem with this approach though, is that the CSI provider uh, and by extension, sort of this volume mount approach means that you have to write the credential to a file. So in this case, if an application needs to read a database username and password, it's done in a file. Uh, not all applications want to read it from files. When you've done applications on Kubernetes for a while, you've probably standardized on injection of secrets through environment variables. So that's a very, very, very different approach. Now, if you still need those Kubernetes secrets because you don't or you can't refactor your application to use the file-based approach, meaning your application can't read those secrets from a file, good news is you can use the secret store CSI driver, the same thing, to synchronize a secret from a secrets manager to a Kubernetes secret. This is perhaps not fully secure in that you still have the Kubernetes secret, so you have to make sure you add role-based access control, make sure that the Kubernetes secret itself uh, is localized uh, access to the namespace or to the application. However, it means that you don't have to refactor your application. So it's a balance between the two, right? Um, this is a good intermediate step. If let's say you have a lot of applications that use environment inje injection and you wanna refactor them to use a file-based approach, in which case this is a good intermediate step. What you do is you deploy uh, the secrets store CSI driver, it's a mouthful, and then you deploy the vault CSI provider. So you can use any kind of provider with any compatible secrets manager. There's some for Azure Key Vault, for example, AWS Secrets Management. This one we're showing today is uh, going to reference Vault, uh, Azure Core Vault. And so what this will do is retrieve the secret and write it to a Kubernetes secret. And so that way an application can reference the Kubernetes secret. We'll show that today in a bit of a demo. Um, if you would like to reference the demo, here's the code for it. Uh, there are some updates that I'm making and you can always check it out uh, in real time as I'm updating them for newer versions of Kubernetes. But let's get to the demo. So it's a little bit easier to see what's going on. All right. So what I have is a, a Kubernetes cluster locally. Um, and in this Kubernetes cluster, I have a couple of uh, applications running, some of which have been deployed by uh, deployed and managed by Flux, for example. So the first is I have a database here. It's a Postgres database, and I have the product API. This would represent my application. My application needs database credentials, and so product API needs to access Postgres database. That's one dependency that we're going to uh, look at today. Um, in the ideal situation, right, uh, I, you, I mentioned that it needs file-based secrets injection, which means you're not writing it as a Kubernetes secret. So for example, if I get the secrets in this namespace, you'll notice nothing is referencing the database, right? So you don't see an opaque type uh, secret that is referencing database username or password. Instead, what we've done is we've configured this Postgres deployment, um, or sorry, this application products API deployment to write the application the application's uh, needed database username and password to a file. And the way we've done that uh, is through injection. So it's hard to tell here, we're, we're gonna scroll down a bit, but what you'll see here is that I have a uh, injector and the injector will write to a mount store database username. So this volume mount here, this is actually the CSI volume mount. Uh, and so you can define it here. The CSI driver will write this to a volume mount path within the container and within accessible to the pod. And what that will do is allow you to retrieve specific entries. So for example, secret store database username, secret state database, database password. Um, and then you can define this as your database connection string. This is some fancy arguments and some fancy commands because Again, this application surprisingly actually did not use a config file. Um, this application uses environment variables. And so you can actually do this sort of workaround by uh, doing this export command early on and then read the information from the file. So there's actually ways to do file-based injection for applications without necessarily refactoring the entire application to use a configuration file. You can do um, some refactor of the deployment itself to let's say read it from, uh, source it from a, uh, that directory or that uh, volume. So that's a quick note. 
And the other important thing is that some of these secrets, right? This is actually a secret provider class that I defined for the CSI uh, provider. Here I have a database username. This is all managed by Vault. So Vault will dynamically create a database credential uh, for username and password. Um, this actually does do auto rotation. However, you will have to reload the application yourself. So while Vault will handle the auto rotation of the database and then it will time out the database username and password, you will have to reload the application yourself. So this is the ideal approach, right? This is what you would say that's the secure approach to injecting a secret from a secrets manager. You're not using a Kubernetes secret at all. But what if you're using something um, you know, in Flux, for example, and Flux itself has to use a Git, you know, a set of tokens, right? It needs a personal access token in order to get to a Git repository. And this is a really interesting problem in that you know, you might need to access a repository uh, like GitLab, and it's a private repository at that. So what you're going to actually do is similarly load uh, the credentials into Vault, or you can use one of uh, Vault's secrets engines to rotate the credentials for you. But at the end of the day, you need to set up Vault with this, that repository token, for example. In this case, I'm using a GitLab deploy token. I've already set it up in vault. But the important thing is that I have a set of GitLab credentials now. I'm using the CSI provider uh, to create those credentials. And the important thing that I specify is the secret objects under specs. What this secret object does is write these credentials to a Kubernetes secret. So I could make a comparison before. But remember before, the secret from the application, which had the database username, database password, we use the file-based approach. There is no Kubernetes secret. However, if I look at the same approach with the CSI provider, but synchronizing to Kubernetes secret, you'll notice that there's a set of credentials that have been automatically created called GitLab credentials. And those contain the username as well as the deploy token required for Flux to access GitLab. And in this situation, you know, you're able to perhaps limit access to that secret within the namespace. This means that Flux itself, when you declare a repository, let me see if I can pull that up. If I declare a repository here, a lot going on. That means when you declare a repository, what that's going to do is retrieve information. Here we go. You can use still the secret ref approach and will retrieve the information from the Kubernetes secret. So remember, two separate approaches. One is the file-based approach. You don't write as a Kubernetes secret. In some ways, you're localizing the, the access to the secret to the application. The second is using CSI provider to synchronize the secret. Uh, and that way, you're able to still use the you know, Kubernetes secret object references that you need for applications that you cannot refactor. And the combination of the two will allow you to automatically retrieve the information you need from the secrets manager. Again, I'm going to caveat this in that if you're rotating something in the secrets manager, you will have to reload or reconcile anything on the application side. So it's not that it's automatically going to reload your application for you. Um, in this scenario, you do have to reload the application after the secret itself has been rotated or it's expired. Go back there. So if you want to try this yourself, you're more than welcome to check out this repository. It has some sample of, it has some examples and it has all of the setup required for uh, the application side for you doing file-based secrets injection or if you're doing sync as Kubernetes secret. Um, you can also look at a number of resources available for other integrations with Vault um, and ways that you can use Flux with Vault. So there's a number of resources on managing uh, secrets in general in Flux, as well as more about the secret store, CSI driver, and the Vault integration specific to CSI. With that, thank you. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out. Great. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, and thanks to you for joining. Uh, just a reminder, uh, this talk is coming during KubeCon, uh, where we are sharing our Flex Your Flux campaign. So if you'd like to win an hour with uh, a Flux maintainer, 
uh, check out this link. Uh, we have a quick little quiz that hopefully will also help you flex your flex knowledge. Uh, and we'll be announcing winners at GitOps Days uh, June 8th through 9th. And that's www.gitopsdays.com. So um, actually, Rosemary will be joining us as well as many other fantastic speakers. So make sure to register for that event as well as enter this to see if you will win an hour with a Flux maintainer. So thank you and we'll see you there.